how many cars have I driven? Well, I started with full Cortina 1.6L Estate Mark III. Uh, moved on to a Morris Marina 1.3 um, during the uh, petrol crisis of the mid 70s. Went back to Mark IV Cortina Estates 1.6. Moved on to Sierra 1.6Ls. I've had three Cavalier 1.6Ls. Then went into management where I drove a Peugeot 405 GTX and my current car, the car I'm in now, which is an Astra CDI 1.6 Saloon. New shape. Some time ago, the company decided to look at the, the car policy uh, for reasons, well, basically, I think costs. And uh, what it meant was that the reps stayed at uh, the same level, which was a 1.6L Cavaliers. But the middle line management department heads, um, national account managers, actually were reduced in levels from uh, the benchmark of a Granada 2 litre L down to a Cavalier 1.8 GL which uh, was tremendous, which basically meant for someone like myself who worked hard to get himself um, into the management levels, suddenly found that he's driving a car basically the same as all his reps. Excuse me while I just pay this toll. Thank you. Cheers. I'd already ordered my 1.8 GL, albeit extremely unhappily. And one day I, I opened the Daily Telegraph and what jumped out of the page but the new Astra 1.6i CD Saloon, brand new model, wonderful looking motor car, spec exactly what I wanted. So I ran hot foot to the guy who handles our company cars and said, hey, wait a minute, can I have one of these? Yes, he says, it's more money, but we can save it on the fuel costs, so you're all right. Fine, I says, I'll have a white one. What do I like about the Astra CDI? Well, it's an I. An I means important these days. Uh, it's a 1.6. It's the top of the range in the luxury Astra range. It's a saloon model, so again, it's a little different from the uh, run-of-the-mill new Astras, which tend to be hatchbacks. Um, from the spec levels, uh, it's got a very good radio. It's ABS braking, uh, electric, electric aerial, electric windows on the front, electrically operated uh, wing mirrors. Leather steering wheel, leather gear knob, uh, pollen filter, alloy wheels, but no CD badge on the back, and that's disappointing. The only place where you see CD on the exterior of the car is down by the front wheel arches, and that's not that clear. So it, you know, it makes it look a bit. Uh, it's difficult for someone following you to know that you're driving a CD Astra. With a lot of company car drivers, what you tend to find is that whatever they're driving at that time is the car. That is the one. Last year it was the Sierra, this year it's the Cavalier. God knows what it'll be next. 
And I'm pretty much the same, I suppose, I've got to be honest. Salesmen are always right, aren't they? I mean, if I bought it, my judgment's bang on, isn't it? So if, if you know, this is the car I've picked, then it's got to be the best thing around. I remember a comment from uh, one of my customers who has a Jaguar asking me how I liked my new Honda and I said with pride it's not a Honda, it's a Nissan Primera. I decided to join a Japanese company and at the third interview we got down to what reps really want to talk about which is what the company car choice is going to be and in the back of my mind I'd secretly got the idea that I was going to be driving a Honda or Toyota to compare to my normal reps car is always a Cavalier or a Sierra and I was really amazed when my fleet manager gave me the choice of a 1.6 L Sierra or a 1.6 L Cavalier in an L spec with no metallic paint with a plain paint finish. I really thought it over quite long and hard and I made the point to my fleet manager that I thought I'd be driving a Japanese car. And he phoned me back and asked me if I'd like to test drive a Nissan. Feature for feature, it had got electric windows, it had got the back pockets which I thought was important, and it had got an electric sunroof. But the features really made it for me. I can remember phoning up some of my old colleagues on my old company and we often got round to talking about car specs, the car specs they were driving and the car spec that I was driving. And some of them were quite snooty, comments like, how's your Datsun, how are you getting on with a Datsun? But when I got round to talking to them about the features that I got, it didn't really feel so bad. In fact, I was quite pleased about the car and obviously the reliability of the car was an envied bonus. My current company car is a Primera 2 litre LS. I chose the Primera because it's got three thumpingly good points. Because I've got twin overhead cam, 16 valve, fuel injected engine. One of those features alone would be enough to make a rep excited. The combination of all those features on the engine really swung the spec for me. Of course there were trade-offs, it didn't have the eye on the back of the car. If they'd have put the eye on the back of the car, it would have got the eye factor. I think that was a really significant omission on this car. Reps spend an absolute fortune on petrol. 
On 120,000 miles of motorway driving, I finally got my colour television on shell points, and the relief to go back to another brand of petrol was unbelievable after that. There it is, the little chef at last. One number 70 coming up for lunch. When I joined the company, I joined as a salesman and I got a Carlton, a 1.8L manual, real salesman's car. I was fortunate enough later on to be promoted and that's when the trouble started. I wanted the car that I was entitled to on my grade. I wanted people to know that I really had been promoted and as driving around as I was in the Carlton, people thought that perhaps it was a temporary appointment and the customers uh, were not that impressed either. Um, I made, I've got to say, I did make quite a nuisance of myself and finally I did get my way and I got this car and it's great. People now really know that I'm a manager, that I'm a senior person within the company. My customers know that, my colleagues know that and my competitors know it. When I got this car, this Merc, I took the uh, I, I took the 200 sign off the back. Mercs are quite expensive cars, and um, the 200 is the um, probably really the bottom of their middle range. And I, I really felt that if I could just hide that, people would think I'd perhaps got a more expensive car than I really had, even though it wasn't cheap. So um, I took the um, I took the 200 e badge off the back. Sort of, sort of bloke I am really. Generally speaking, people defer to you. They just recognise the class and quality of the car. I'd like to think that rubs off on the person. So I find that people do, they move over for you, they give you a bit more room, they look at you, all those sort of things. When, you, when they see you coming up behind them in the, in the mirror, providing you don't get too close, and you don't drive too aggressively, they, they'll pull over and let you pass. A lot of salesmen treat their cars as mobile offices. But I don't. I have a car phone, that's all I have, and that's for talking to people, for issuing instructions and talking to my salespeople. Um, if I wanted a mobile office, I'd rent a room in a hotel. Um, in fact, I do that quite frequently. If I'm en route somewhere, I want to do any work, rent a room in a hotel. I'm not going to be seen sitting in this car um, doing my paperwork. That's for reps.
cars are very important to salespeople. Very important things. Mind you, cost not everybody thinks that. I've had a run in with the personnel manager rest only the other day. And I said that this isn't a game. And she said, no, company cars aren't a game, they're a disease. I should say the vast majority would have thought there is quite a senior manager. This is the perception that people would have of somebody who drives something a little out of the ordinary. What they probably didn't realise was that my car was the same price, if not cheaper than theirs, which means in, in reality I was the same as them, but because I had something a little different, I was perceived differently. I knew I'd have to have a Ford car. Uh, in the ideal world I wouldn't, but my company stipulated that the vehicle I would have would be a Ford. I looked at the price list, I looked at what I should have been able to have, and uh, I noticed very early on that uh, a Ford Fiesta XR2i was available to me, certainly in terms of price. So from that day on, the fun and games began. I began to put pressure on my immediate manager, on the fleet manager, on my manager's manager, to try and get them to understand why I should have an Ford XR2i, and I gave them all sorts of reasons. Every salesperson has to wear a suit and uh, when they're driving they don't like to wear their jackets. And in the same way that most salespeople drive Sierras and uh, in Cavaliers, I'd say that most of those people will hang their jackets in the backs of their cars. As far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't be seen dead with my my coat on a hanger in the back of my car. Uh, although it's probably the most practical thing to do with your with your, with your jacket. In terms of image, it's uh, a dead donkey. Uh, I hang my coat, or I put my coat in the back of my car on the back seat. So when people are coming past me, they don't think I'm a salesperson. I don't drive a salesperson's car, and I don't have my jacket swinging in the back of it. The hanger I'm using today is a, a wood look-alike hanger for Marks and Spencers, but I've actually got uh, Yves Saint Laurent and a Harrods hanger. But I've probably got more Marks and Spencers hangers than I have the others. The type of hanger I have in the back of my car is one of the plastic type, which curve into the shoulders of the jacket and provide support for it to give it a good shape. I always hang it on a wooden coat hanger. I never hang it from the handle because it, it can make it lose its shape and it keeps the body of the jacket looking good. Coat hangers contain 
so much naff information and don't have information like uh, Savile Row hangers or Giorgio Armani badges on them so they can be somewhat embarrassing if someone reads it while you're travelling on the motorway. Normally I hang the coat on the coat hook which most cars have got. Unfortunately on this particular car the coat hook broke so the coat has to lay on the back seat. motorway driver knows that certain cars are better than his own and very often you'll find yourself in a situation where you're going near the top speed that your car has and there's a guy in a Mercedes or a Porsche coming up behind you and you just pull in because you know that his car's better than yours and uh, you're just acknowledging that he's got more power than you and in the same way when I'm in the middle lane perhaps doing 80 miles an hour and there's a Sierra which I know has less power than my car and he's trying to push past at maximum speed, I'll very often just put my foot down, the power will come on immediately without having to build up and the Sierra will have to struggle to just get parallel with me and the best result is that uh, he'll probably end up going back into the middle lane and uh, his attempt at overtaking me has failed and that's a success. Whenever I leave a motor, I always feel a tinge of sadness because they're so, uh, how can I put it, they're so unreal. When you leave a motorway, you're joining normality again, back to where your road's doing 50 and 60, which is never a very nice feeling. Back to normality again. The big difference between a GL and a GLI is the I, because the I stands for I am bloody brilliant, I am quicker than you on the road, it is a, an extension of a man's ego, it's like having a five bedroom detached house in three and a half acres of countryside. There ain't no way that somebody's going to tell me that having better spec on a car, a CD or whatever, is better than having the I badge on the back. It means... I've got status, that's what it means.
first thing to do is if somebody's up your tailgate, want it to get past, you have a look in the mirror, you can see it's a Vauxhall Cavalier, you have a look at the, the bumpers if it's got colour coded bumpers, that means if the bumper's painted the same colour as the car, it, it's, it's, it's something other than a base, it's got to be at least a GL, so the chances are it could be a GLI, so you're on a par with that guy, but if it's got like headlight washers, you look in the mirror and it's got headlight washers, you think, oh my god, it's an SRI, it's a CDI, it's a GSI, so you eat humble pie, put the car, drop the car down, put the indicator on and pull over, and you really thank you very much as he goes past. But there ain't no way somebody'd go past in a base. Not if they're going to the same place as me. That's what I had last time, one of those. Look at that, that fine vehicle there. Escort Estate, dear me. No disrespect to escort diesel drivers, but you've got something sadly missing in your life if you lumbered with one of them. I don't know, I, when I went for this interview with this company I'm with now, I parked the Escort diesel round the back of the building and walked a quarter of a mile round to the front for my interview. And when I'd had my interview and my, what is now my present boss and escorted me to the door. She said, oh, where's your car? And I said, oh, I've, I've parked it round back because I didn't, know, I didn't know where to park. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to let her see what I've got. Because she was offering me Cavaliers and Sierras and things like that. And there was no way I was going to let her see I've got a bloody Escort Diesel estate. for all the environmental people that harp on about diesels. Look at the shit coming out of that diesel van. And they try and tell me that driving a diesel is more environmentally sound. Look at the shit coming out of that. And that's on a brand new, it's on a K plate. Jesus wept. Here's a typical rep looking at his 414 SLI. He's got his jacket hung up on a coat hanger, doesn't it look pretty? He's got his no smoking little ticket hung down off his passenger visor. Mr. Stereotype. A few of us have got a thing for the, um, the new Mazda 626. I think a few of us will be going for that, given the choice next time. One of my colleagues has just been fortunate enough to acquire it and we went to a sales meeting and I, parked, I arrived there 10 minutes before him, parked down the, uh, the car park drive there, gets out of the car and I looks up and lo and behold there's this long sleeky burgundy Mazda 626 slowly coming into the car park, I couldn't believe it, out gets my colleague, looks me straight in the eye and said, you're jealous aren't you? And I said no. No, no, all the car, the car's part and parcel of the job and I come out with all the bullshit that you would expect. And he knows, he knows deep down that he's, he's beating me with that one. But I'll get one. If I have to die, if I have to work till I, I sweat blood and die, I will get one of them. Some of the journeys, Jesus Christ, the, the monotonous ones, say from Rotherham, Sheffield, up to Newcastle can take anything up to like four hours and the monotony side of it, it oh, it's, it's dreadful. You, you tend to switch off. I, I can go through a, a city. I can go through like Sheffield or Leeds, and, and be, be 30 miles further north and think, have I been through Leeds yet? Have I been through bloody Sheffield? Which way did I come? And it's it's a real problem is monotony. And you've got to you, you've got to switch off from it sometimes. Although I'm sure me driving safe, I do switch off. I think about the wife, the the home. I think about football Saturday. Oh great, it's Thursday today. I've only got tomorrow then we're off to football on Saturday. 
and I'll, I'll arrive and I'll arrive somewhere and there's big chunks missing out of the journey because the road becomes that familiar that you tend not to take as much notice as, as if it were a fresh journey. My ideal car is a Vauxhall Calibra, a big bright red one. Um, I would like to think, yes, in two or three years' time, I'm successful enough in whatever I'm doing to be able to say, I want a Calibra. Unfortunately, we have a company car policy at the minute, which would forbid that, but I'm working on it. Basically, this maestro is crap. I feel as though the company have, have quite frankly, shit on me, for want of a better word. But, um, I've not been treated very well at all. Certainly not the way I was promised I'd be treated. Still, better that than having a job than not. When you're driving on the motorway, um, time factor getting from one call to another is a thing. The fact that you can easily get overtaken by uh, HGVs, quite easily. Um, what worries me about it is that there's no power there. The first car that the company gave me was a Citroen BX from the company transport pool. I drove that around for a while, then I was given what I thought would be my permanent car, which was a 2 litre injection Vauxhall Cavalier. I was over the moon with the Cavalier. It was the sort of vehicle that I would have chosen, apart from it not being diesel. I would have probably chosen that sort of vehicle for myself. Uh, at that time I thought that, that I'd got basically what I'd been promised. I then got a telephone call some time later to say that a new car was available for me at the, uh, the transport pool. So I drove the Cavalier back down to the transport pool, um, went into the manager's office, took the key for the Cavalier off the key fob and put it on his desk. Then I saw a key fob with Rover on it for me. Um, at that time I thought, well, what am I getting? Is it uh, 215, uh, 216, you know, something like that. A nice, nice Rover. When I asked what I was getting, it said a Maestro, which at first didn't seem too bad. And when he said it was a diesel maestro, things started getting worse. When I actually went outside and saw the vehicle, it was a maestro diesel clubman.
my heart sunk. I felt absolutely sick. I just handed over the keys to a two litre injection cavalier down to a basic plugman. I'm absolutely shattered. I actually drove it back up to the depot where I work from. All the staff obviously came out to have a look at the new car and basically fell about laughing. Um, apparently, all the staff knew what I was getting in advance. They thought it was highly amusing, the fact that, uh, that I felt so let down. It really was a, a sickening blow for me. Obviously my wife knew that I was getting a new car that day, asked me what I got, when I told her, the absolute embarrassment of it, we, we both literally sat down and cried, we physically cried. From going from the Cavalier that I had before, down to this, just wondered what I'd basically done wrong to deserve it. I couldn't understand, neither could she. And my wife basically said, after looking at it, there's no way I'm going to drive in that. And from this day, <laughs> that day to this, she's never been in the car. She can't stand the car. I suppose she never will go any deeper. When I had my Cavalier 2 litre injection, like most reps, I'd hang my coat up in the back, uh, basically as a status symbol. I don't do that anymore, I simply lay the coat on the back seat. If I go into a service station or anything like that, again, I'll try to be as inconspicuous as I can, even to the extent of removing my tie and trying to look like a, a Mr Average, a family man, rather than a company car driver. You have a, an image of somebody that drives a BMW as being successful, executive type, thrusting, really made their way beyond the run-of-the-mill type company car driver in the Sierras or, or Cavaliers. And it's an outward sign to you and to the rest of the world. You've made what is quite a big step and, and achieved things. It was a wonderful feeling when I, I turned up in my fairly grotty old Sierra to pick up my first BMW. And there she was with the 1st of August registration. So everybody on the road knew that it was brand new today when I drove it out of the car park. The company I was working for at the time, when I was driving the BMW, ran a sales competition for which the prize was a sports car. I won that competition and was presented with this three litre wonderful sports car, the Toyota Supra. It was an interesting move going from quality German to the Japanese manufacturer. You're not a Cavalier or a Sierra driver, but also you're not a BMW or Mercedes driver. And if people are making some sort of judgment from your car, as almost everybody does, it's very difficult to pitch what that reaction is going to be if you're driving a Japanese car.
my next car after the Supra was a Peugeot 309. The background to that was that I left the company that I had been working for and set up on my own and obviously wanted to keep the cost base down. So went for a much, much cheaper profile of car. That had a couple of interesting uh, sides to it. I'd turn up at the cricket club. One day I'm in a smart sports car, the next day I'm in a small, grotty French uh, saloon car. And you wondered, I wondered very much what um, my friends at the cricket club thought about that. Has he gone down in the world? Is he failing? All those sorts of thoughts. It had an, also an interesting business ramification because I'd turn up at clients and I wanted to portray a good image of the company. My business card said director on it. That's what I was. And yet the car didn't really reflect that sort of image. And so just once or twice I'd park it round the corner and walk round just to make sure that the clients wouldn't see me in a car that wasn't befitting to the position that I was trying to portray. Terrible to admit, isn't it? But it's true. What a disaster that was. My business failed and I lost a lot of money. I lost my nice big house and it was even a major factor in the breakup of my marriage. Now I'm trying to rebuild things. I got a job for a short while with a Cavalier and then I moved to my present company um, where the benchmark car for my job as regional manager was and still is a Mercedes 190E. I didn't really want a Mercedes. I know it's a lovely car but somehow the wrong sort of image, wrong sort of profile for me. And so over a period of time I worked on my boss really by saying if he really wanted to motivate his new employee uh, shouldn't this be something that he should be considering and indeed it worked that actually gave me a, another slight problem of course because I had a different car coming to me than my contemporaries and the last thing I wanted to do joining a new company was upset them so I went through a process of just laying the ground rules or foundations a little bit, saying that I hoped I was getting a BMW rather than a Mercedes. And then a few days later, well, I hoped there was going to be a few bits on it. Whereas, of course, I had specifically asked for the leather upholstery, for the sunroof, for the quality radio cassette. And so in that way, when I actually arrived with the BMW, I didn't put their noses out of joint. And that was important, having just joined a new company. Trying to get a, a better standard of car is really a universal objective. And so I suppose what I'm trying to do is strike a balance between the thrusting achiever driving his two litre fuel injected uh, BMW coupe and also being a nice guy. And that's not easy.